Okay, everybody ready to study the Word of God, yes or no? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love the way you speak to us by your Spirit, and we love the way you speak to us by your Word. And so, Lord, we submit to your Spirit always, and here this morning for the next 30 or 40 minutes, we submit to your Word to teach us and train us. And Lord, we thank you for the way you inspire us and the way you lead us and the way you protect us from temptation and the way you give us strength so we can overcome temptation so we do not have to fail. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, everybody, this morning, uh, the material that we want to cover right quick is something that most of you have heard before, so I'm not going to belabor it like we did last week. And I don't have to hit it as hard because it's more familiar to all of us. And that is that we are the body of Christ. Now, we're in a series, as you can see in your bulletin. Uh, we've already talked about we are his people. We're his portion. We've already talked about how it takes transformation and a personal relationship to be part of the body of Christ. But we can't be part of the church if we stay independent. We, we have to switch identities. So if you say you're a Republican or a Democrat, that becomes subservient to the fact that you are uh, a church member. You're a member of the ecclesia, the body of Christ. If you're a gang member or if you are uh, part of the city council, those identifications have to become subservient to the fact that you are a Christian. And so if you're an entrepreneur or if you are a political activist or uh, you're part of some professional organization or group, your identification switches to that of the church because God wants a people. And God appreciates these other groups. God appreciates the Elks. God appreciates the March of Dimes. God appreciates the wonderful benevolent activities that are going on through corporations, that are going on through uh, nonprofit organizations. All these identification points are wonderful. Maybe you identify as a woman, and that is your primary thing. I am woman, and I am strong, the old song says. Well, you are Christian, and you are strong now. See? And so male or female, black or white, slave or free, all of that begins to melt away as you become his portion. You identify with the body of Christ, Christian, Christ-like. That's a major identification shift. Because some people say they've said the sinner's prayer, but they never made the identification shift. And that, that's a major transfer that just has to happen for us to be what he really called us to be. He did not save you as an individual to be an individual. He saved you as an individual to be part of his portion, to be his team. So we talked about that. Then we talked about how as a group, we are his governing assembly. And all of us have been taught some way or another in the body of Christ that we have authority in Christ. So we've marched around our bedrooms and our prayer rooms and our prayer closets exercising our authority. And sometimes we wonder why it didn't have the punch that it was promised to have. And it's because those promises are plural. Those promises, the power promises are largely for what happens when two or three together gather together in my name. And so there's an identification with the body that has additional power because as a group, we have governing authority. And as a group, we will have that governing authority in heaven. So uh, being in a hyper-individualized society causes us to read plural scriptures as first-person singular. And so when we should talk about we and what we can do and what we can accomplish, we often talk about I what I want to do, what I want to accomplish, and what I think. All right, so this is a major transition when we realize we're part of a body. Now, every one of you are sitting here in your bodies right now, and your bodies are expressing what's going on inside of you. All right, so you got up this morning, you got dressed, you cleaned up, uh, you got your clothes on, you jumped in the car, and you came here all in your body. So your body expressed uh, your desire to worship. Your body expressed your desire to sing. Your body expressed your desire to take care of your kids. 
So you used your fingers, your arms, your legs, your voice. Some of you ate breakfast this morning, and when you were hungry, you fed your body. And all of that stuff you ate this morning is still inside of you. All right, and it is working inside of you. And so if you get angry this afternoon, your body will express it. If you get bitter this afternoon, really bitter, then your body will express it somehow. So your spirit, when your spirit is stirred up inside of you, your body expresses it through giving, through worship, through loving, whatever. If you get angry, your body will express it. You do what you want to do through your body. And you say what you want to say through your body. Your body is the express mechanism for your spirit, your soul, your mind. So your body is the way you do this. I have this stuff in my heart. I read the scriptures. It gets in my mind and my heart. But on Sunday mornings, I've got to say it through my body. All right. And then you receive it through your body. You're watching me with your eyes. You're hearing me with your ears. Your, your body is sitting there. If you're starting to get hungry, you're starting to wonder how long I'm going to talk. Okay? And so all of that is going on, and all those are bodily functions. If you were up all night last night working, your body is tired, and I'm going to see you fight to stay awake, and I appreciate that. Others of you are bright and alert. You feel good. Okay? So, so our bodies are huge. And God thought the same thing about Jesus. That's why he sent Jesus. Because he had been trying to speak to humanity through prophets. But prophets speak through their own lens. And prophets speak through what they understand largely. Some of them uh, are able to go above that. And so here we received the law through Moses. We received all these prophetic utterances. That's the Old Testament. But then I think the way it happened was God said, you know what? People are starting to get off track because of the way they hear words from a prophet, but it's not modeled for them enough. I'm going to send my own son so they can see in a body what I'm really like. All right, so that's why we study so closely the life of Christ. It's because the life of Christ, his life, is of greater importance than Paul's letters and John's letters or from any of the Old Testament scriptures. Because Jesus himself is the embodiment of God's nature and life. The prophets had slices of it, but they saw through a glass darkly just like we do. All right? And so God sent a body. And when he was in his body here on the earth... We could watch that and watch him forgive people, watch him heal people, watch him turn water into wine. That really benefited all of you that love alcohol, okay? It, yeah, I mean, and that was, an, uh, that was a change. I mean, he changed all kinds of things. Jesus all, was saying to the religious leaders, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, you know what he was doing? He was updating the revelation of past, uh, past words from prophets, and he was correcting ideas, ideals through his body. What he did was just as important as what he said. We have a lot written down about what he said, but not nearly all he said. And we have a lot written down about what he did. But see, he did it through his body. His physical body here on the earth made the message clearer and clearer to us who are living with a fallen human nature and living with a devil and his demons and bad ideas and all kinds of things going on. So, in Ephesians 1, and 23, it says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Here, let's, Lisa, are you close to that? Okay, all right, I want you to see this. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things. What are these last four few words? For the benefit. Read it out loud, everybody. For the benefit of the church. Now, this is the group. It's not you. It is you to the degree that you're connected with the group. Do you see it? And so if we in our Western culture would say, well, he did all this for my benefit. To the degree that you are in the church. 
See, and so here's what he's highlighting here. God is a triune being. He has three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect relationship with one another. In such perfect relationship with one another, he is one. He's three in one because of the relationship. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all admiring one another, taking care of one another, adoring one another, all that kind of thing. You were created in his image and likeness. That means you cannot be independent and accomplish your task. You've got to be in relationship with others. So what do you think the devil tries to destroy in you more than anything else? Your relationships. So families are to be a model of that. What does the devil attack? Families. Okay, any team working together is to be a model of that. What does the devil attack? Those relationships. Families. Churches. Okay, so, so he just tries to tear it up. Oh man, you just... You look around at the criticism of the church nowadays. But the church has done more good for humanity than any other institution. There would be no hospitals if it weren't for the church. I could go on and on and on with a list of things that the church has done for the world. All right? But notice this. Jesus did all this for the benefit of the church. That's a very important thing for us to see. All right? Then the next verse. Look at this. And the church is his, what's it say? Body. It is made full and complete by whom? Who fills all things everywhere with himself. Okay. Christ is the head of the body. Like your head is the head of your body. The most efficient way to kill your arms and your legs and your fingers and your intestines and your toes the best way to kill all those would be to cut off your head. It's quick. It's efficient. It's, oh, those of you with French descent, you know the efficiency of it. Okay, so, so to just lop off a person's head is the easiest way to make your body worthless, dysfunctional, unable to accomplish a thing. So why do you think the, word, the, the name of the head of the church, Jesus Christ, is the most popular cuss word in the world. And why do you think there are massive institutions designed to undo the lordship of Jesus and just make religion a good works organization to make people feel better? See, the church is his body. That's us. It is made full and complete by Christ. Your body gets its direction from your head. And your body works together by your head. Jonathan has some brain damage. He has some chromosomal problems, so his brain doesn't work right. That's why he can't speak normally. But he's got everything, he, everything you have and you speak normally. But he doesn't get the signals right from his head. All right? And so you see people with brain damage. Gail and I, when Jonathan was up at Triangle Cross Ranch... There was a fella that was in the armed services. When he went into the armed service, he was handsome. He was strong. He was able to do all the things he was uh, needing to do. He was the picture of a strong young man. But something happened to him somewhere, and now he's sitting up there in a bedroom. Somebody dresses him every day. He's very nice, but he can't function because something happened to his head. Everybody... The head of our body is what balances, that, that triggers the system so your chemicals are balanced. If you ate too much fat this morning and not enough protein, your, your brain is sending signals so your body will balance that out, hopefully. Okay, and so your body's always doing that. When you go jogging, it's your brain that gives a signal to the heart to raise the rate, cleans out your cardiovascular system a little bit. It does all that. It refreshes you. It empowers you. When you exercise, your head coordinates what goes on in your body. But you see, that happens in a group because every one of your cells affect your other cells. And every one of your bones affect the rest of your body. Your fat affects, the, the fat is the largest organ in your body. And it works all the time adjusting heat, adjusting chemistry, adjusting all kinds of things. If you, if you had no fat, you would be dead. 
All right? And so every one of us have these different organs in us, and they all feed off of one another. And this is very important for all of us that are believers because we've lived in a culture that says, I am me, and I can do this, and I am strong. And so because of it, we've started to look at church as an entertainment institution, and we just go to the hottest speaker, or the hottest moment, or the hottest this, or the hottest that, and we actually think it's our organization. But it is not. And so when it says, and the church is his body, it is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. My body is receiving electrical impulses and chemical adjustments as I'm giving this talk right now. And imagine what the church would be like without Jesus as the head. That's why in this church we sing the old songs that still talk about the blood of Jesus. We sing the songs that talk about Jesus as the head. We worship the Lord Jesus because he is the head of the church. If Jesus is not the head, it is not the church. It may be an organization, but it's not the church. So we relate to the whole world through our bodies. God relates to, through, to the world through his body. It is through our body that we get things done. It is through Jesus' body that he gets things done. Okay? Christ relates to the world through his body. We relate to the world through our bodies. We are the instruments by which the works of redemption are available to the world. Now, let's talk about Jesus' body just a little bit more and then I'll move on. In Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, notice this. That is why when Christ came to the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given a body to offer. You have given me a body to offer. This is Jesus knowing why he was here in the body. One of the reasons why he had a body. You were not pleased with burnt offerings, and other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the scripture. So you see, Jesus' body sacri sacrificed, opened the door, follow this everybody, for us to become his body. Jesus, this, this passage shows that Jesus was on earth not to condemn the world, not to bring judgment on the world, but to redeem the world from our sins. And in order to do that, he had to give his body away. Now, here's where I'm going to go with this. He had to do that on the cross in order for our sins to be forgiven so that we could have redemption. You have to give your body away to get redemption to our world. Jesus had to sacrifice himself, his body on the tree for us to be redeemed. We have to sacrifice our body on the altar for the world to be able to see Christ. So now let's talk, let's go back now, talk about Jesus' body. It was the physical body of Jesus that became his sacrifice. And, and it's the body of God's collective people on earth that still continues and completes his ministry. Are you following this? When we glorify the fact that Jesus gave himself on the cross, you have to identify with that. And give your body away so that others can be redeemed. Does that make sense? Jesus suffered on the cross. You've got to suffer on an altar. Romans 12 verses 4 and 5. You're familiar with this already. Here it says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. So here it's talking about the group. And then it says, 
The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some of us are free. But we have all been baptized by one body, into one body, by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Okay, now notice the key words here are one. We are all baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Okay, so Paul goes ahead and develops this idea. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am a, uh, not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But your bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Okay, now look at me, everybody. The body of Christ has many parts. You are one of those parts, and God has put you just where you want it. Uh, just where God wants it. Okay, so how would you get Christ's body sick? Okay, let's say you're a hand and you decide you don't like what the arm is having you do. So you leave. Or let's, let's say you're the large intestine and you're sick of having to handle all the crap that goes on. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever known anybody that had their large intestine removed. It's not good. It's a tough life. There's a whole different dimension. If we don't have a way of, all right, let's say your sweat glands. And you say, this job stinks. <laughs> Without your sweat glands, you'd be dead pretty fast. Because you'd overheat. You would have to be in a very controlled position. You would not be free to be out and about like you are right now. All right, so let's say your sweat glands leave or your large intestines leave. Let's say your, what? Your leg decides, I'm not carrying the weight around here anymore. You see it? Can you name a part of your body you'd love to get rid of and that you could functionally normally with? You can't because we're totally interdependent. If my large intestine's working properly, well, every other cell in my body feels better. If my stomach and esophagus is working properly, every, every other part of my body feels better. If my neuromuscular system is working properly, I'm stronger, I can move more, I can do things. If it starts to go haywire, there are things I, ca I can't do anymore. So there's, there's no part of us that we, see, okay, every part of us keeps every other part healthy. And any part can make us weaker if it dysfunction or it's got to leave. Now, we can survive. Keith here, Keith is up hunting, I think, in Iowa right now. Think of that, going hunting with a blind guy. Okay, so he does it, but he... But he does have a shooter with him. But his sense of hearing is so keen, very often he hears the animal before the guy that goes with him sees it. And he can get pretty close. His sense of hearing is so keen, he can tell what the animal is, and he can get an approximate weight of it by how it sounds in the forest. Think of that. That's Keith. He sits right over there. He knows more about you than you think. Okay, all right, so, so you see, but, but we look at him, but, but it's hard. Sometimes Jonathan goes over to McDonald's for him to get him a hamburger on Wednesday nights because he comes early, all right, because it's hard for him. He can't, when he's crossing the road, if he didn't know the time, he didn't know if it's dark or light. 
So he, it, so when it gets to be wintertime, if he's not watching the clock, he may be crossing the road out here assuming people can see him. But it may be dark outside because it's 5 o'clock or 445. So all the rest of his organs have to try to compensate for the loss of his eyes. In your eyes, there are roughly 5 million parts interacting with one another. Why don't you build something in that little space? Oh, yeah. Oh, don't let me get. I don't want to confuse you. That all happened by itself. Just like your car. Nobody made it. It just evolved over the last 100 years. OK, so everybody see this? Now, here's, the, here's what you got to get, though. You're part of the body. The number one trick the devil can get in you is that you're just an observer, or you're just a casual participant, or you're just wh whatever. See, he'll try to minimize you. And he'll try to say you're being misused, like the large intestine, intestine can definitely say that. OK? Or, or maybe the duodenum in your body, you know, that connects the various parts of your body. Or what about your joints and ligaments? You're rough on your joints. And the ligaments hold your bones together. If you didn't have ligaments holding them together, your bones would just be a haphazard mess. You'd be a blob <laughs> with some bones in it. OK, so, so do you know what the ligaments are? Ligaments are re your relationships. And so you, all right, I hate to say this in this culture because this just sounds so brutal. You really aren't that important. But you are very important as a group. And as you're attached to the group, your importance takes on greater significance as you achieve your role. As you, if the mouth doesn't do his work, then the esophagus and the stomach can't do its work the same. And so as the mouth realizes what its responsibilities are, then everything else starts to work. Well, that's you. You become increasingly important as you realize your role in the group. Your purpose in life is established as you realize the function that you have in the body, whether you like it or not. Because every function is irreplaceable and vitally important. See? Does this make sense? I think it's brilliant, frankly. <laughs> so here it says, let's, let's go all the way down to verse 18. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. See, and that's the part we're queasy about. Because we don't like some people. See, so, so that's where we've got to get beyond ourselves. I'll never forget when we were up in our basement on Lightning Way, up by Challenger Middle School. This was several centuries ago. We were starting a prayer meeting that evolved into New Life Church. People would come to that prayer meeting. We had 40, 50 people in the prayer meeting in our basement. People would come to it, and if they would tell me the story about the church they came from and they left it badly, I'd send them back. I'd say, you go back, you make that right, we're not going to have that stuff go on. But the Lord was trying to add people to the church. So there was a lady named Mary, and I knew her for probably 30 years, knew all of her kids, and she only gave me one prophecy in those 30 years. She came up to me in that prayer meeting and she said, Ted Haggard, the Spirit of the Lord has a word for you. And of course, I was a 28-year-old guy, and all the prophecies I received were positive. And so she said, the Lord has a word for you. And I said, sure, Mary, what is it? And she said, the Lord wants you know, to know that you don't have the authority to send people away from this church. And you need to stop it. Because if the Holy Spirit is sending people here to learn how to pray and how to serve the word, you are usurping his authority by sending them back to a place that wasn't feeding them. Now the Lord was building a body, a body that ended up giving millions to missions and doing some wonderful things, empowering thousands of people in their ministries. But here it says, the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. 
And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In Ephesians 4.16, it says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So here's, here, hey, look at me, everybody. I want to say something profound. <laughs> okay? You don't know what it's like when you're not here. None of you know what it's like when you're not here. And for the majority of you, it's better when you're here. That was a joke. <laughs> Meaning, for some people, it's better when you're not here. But, but no. See, none of us know what it's like when we're not in the room. So if this verse is true, is the Bible true? You tell me. Yeah. See, that's the problem. That the Bible's true. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. Is that true or false? So that the whole body is healthy. We've already discussed that. And growing and full of love. That's the skill. Where we intentionally get out of ourselves and learn how to build relationships with people that we wouldn't normally connect with. Relationships being ligaments that hold the bones together, make the joints function, so that all the other organs can function on a frame. We all cause the other parts to do their best work. If one part gets sick, it strains and sometimes prevents the rest of the parts from working. So what do we need? What are the key words? What do we need to keep all the parts healthy? I'm going to give you four words here. One, obedience. I know that's the most popular word in America today. Obedience. You know what concerns me? One of the things that concerns me about America today is the fact that we are glorifying rebellion. And that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Here's the parallel. Witchcraft is the soliciting of demonic forces in order to manipulate somebody else. Rebellion is the soliciting of demonic forces in order to manipulate somebody else. And so... It starts just with obedience. Obedience to the head. So if something in my body is saying it needs more insulin now, or it needs more of whatever now, the, the part responds and that happens. So I don't need an artificial device to try to make it happen. So obedience, simple obedience. Then another real popular word, submission. So, submission to the head and to one another. The heart is sending out signals. You know, now we're learning that all of our cells have a little brain in them. And they're all interdependent, sending signals to each other. So, your fat's sending signals to different parts of your body and your uh, legs are and your bones are. And all, all these signals are going on in your body that are just incredible to make it so everybody works well. And the third word is willingness. Willingness. Fourth word is availability. These four words, they may be worth you taking note of, of, of just obedience, submission, willingness, availability. Obedience, submission, willingness. Okay, name one corporation that could produce a good or a service without those four ingredients. Name one, those of you in the military, name one team that could successfully accomplish a mission without those four ingredients. Okay, for those of you on city council or serving some way or another, uh, try, to, try to have a home without these four ingredients. How are you going to decide what you're going to have for supper? And can everybody veto it? And so it's just simple. Obedience, submission, willingness, and availability. It says... Colossians 2, 18 and 19 says, Don't let anyone condemn you 
by insisting on positive, pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments. And it grows as God nourishes it. So as I've said before, in the Bible, when it talks about ligaments, that's relationships. Joints, those are connection points. Those of you with kids connect to the nursery, different than those of us who have all of our kids grown. But it's the relationship that makes the nursery work with you and vice versa. Same with children's church, same, same with men's meeting. And so these covenant commitments we have with one another do some great things. And so now in closing, our part, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find accept acceptable. This is truly the way to worship God. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So everybody, these four key words, obedience, submission, willingness, and availability, they're all in Romans 12, 1 and 2. All right, so number one, present your body. Number two, renew your mind. Number three, as you're renewing your mind, discover, you discover the will of God. And in number four, you set aside your independence and you use your strength to bless others. Let's all stand and pray. Everybody got this, yes or no? All right. Just open your hands toward heaven. Just repeat this prayer of commitment after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I present my body to you now. I give you my hands. I give you my head. I give you my feet. I give you my will. I give you my stubbornness. I give you my independence. And I submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I am your friend. I am your servant. And I am your slave. I surrender all. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for healing me. So I can be part of the body. Operating with a clear conscience. Operating with a powerful strength. To keep one another healing. He, to keep one another healthy. To make the body strong. I'm here. I'll do my part. And I'll do it well. Now let me pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you that you sent your son in a body to give your life away for us. And now we give our bodies away so that we can give life to our generation. Father, we give you our time. Father, we give you our money. Father, we give you our influence. Father, we give you our all because we realize that you are the head of the church. And every one of us wants you to be our head. And so, Heavenly Father, we're open to receiving signals from you. Heavenly Father, we're open to receiving commands from you. And Lord, we will stay connected through the ligaments. We will be strong through the bones. And Lord, we will function well as a body of believers. And Lord, we know as your portion, as your people that are called out of the 
group of all of humanity. As your people, we know that we are your governing assembly. We know that we are your ambassadors. We know that we are your representatives. And so, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we celebrate that. And that makes us look at one another and love one another more. Because we know that every person in this room and many others make our lives better and better and better. So, Heavenly Father, we turn away from sin that would cause us to be dysfunctional or selfish or sick. We turn away from greediness or hatefulness or judgmentalism that would cause us to, to think about things that are really none of our business. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we celebrate the fact that you're our King and you're our Lord, you're our God, and we just love being your body. We love being your hand, your eye, your touch, your voice. We love being your kindness. We love being your gentleness. We love being your grace. We love being your emotions. We love being your hand extended. We love being your favorite. Lord, we love being your body. Thanks for choosing us. Thank you for pulling us out of the group. Thank you for setting us apart. And thank you for setting us in your church, your institution. And Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor and we give you praise because we think you're awesome. In Jesus' name, amen, everybody.